right, welcome back in today. We're looking at the Jets offensive line. We're right here at the end of the 2020 season. Got a couple of games left. And then moving forward, what to do in the 2021 season. Getting ready for, for that. I've got everybody up here on the board just about. I think I'm missing like one person. But I think I've got everybody that needs to be addressed here for the offensive line for the New York Jets. Before I get to the individual guys, and we will go step by step through everybody, uh, I really want to give Joe Douglas a lot of credit for upgrading the offensive line coming into this season. Um, is it a great offensive line? No, it's not. Is it a middle-of-the-pack offensive line? No, it's not even that good. But it's a definite upgrade from what you were in 2019 and 2018. This group of starters here for the past two seasons, not this season, but two previous seasons, was an abomination. I mean, they were getting just horrible individual grades, Ds and Fs all across the board, could not really even compete. I mean, it was a bad offensive line. And Joe Douglas stepped in last year. He did what he said he was going to do, both from the draft standpoint and from spending money and upgraded this offensive line. And you can see the middle of the pack of the NFL from where you currently are. This offensive line this year, and I know you had some injuries, but that's going to happen every season in the NFL to almost every position group. It's, it's a rare thing. It's not... It's not unheard of, but it's rare for you not to have significant injuries to different position groups as the season goes along. So I'm really not counting the injuries too much unless I'm assessing individual performance. But injuries notwithstanding, this offensive line was competitive all year long. It got better as the season went along, which you would expect that, having five new starters. Um, we look at the sacks allowed. They Again, they weren't great, but they're nowhere near the bottom of the league. They're closer to the middle of the pack, much closer. They're still kind of in that bottom third, lower middle third threshold, but they are much closer to the middle of the pack this year than they've been the past two seasons. When you look at the running game, they've been so far through 14 games, averaging over 100 yards per game rushing, which is right there, again, closer to the middle of the pack than it is the bottom of the league. And so credit Joe Douglas for doing what he said he was going to do and getting an offensive line here that was competitive this season for 2020. Now, personally, and we're going to go through and look at these guys, personally, I don't think this is complete. I think you still need another quality starter to step in here, and we'll talk about that in a second. But major credit to Joe Douglas for upgrading this offensive line from being the worst in the NFL for two seasons or competing for the worst in the NFL for two seasons and then stepping up and moving that up. So definite upgrades here for the Jets. They competed all year, and I don't just mean that they competed effort-wise. I mean they competed performance-wise, which is all that really counts when you're, when you're grading these things and going back through and seeing where you get better. They got better, and, and, and so credit Joe Douglas for that. Let's start off with the tackles. Fant and, and Becton, and, and I'm going to start right there at the top with George Fant. Um, some of these guys are a little bit hard to grade because they're right there on that threshold of is this a guy you trust to hold this starting job or is this a guy that, that we could replace? With George Fant, we, we kind of know what George Fant is. He's a very consistent player now. I, I feel much better about him this year than I did last offseason. He's a very consistent player based on four years of playing now, I think, but he is not a guy who can guarantee that you just feel good about that tackle spot being taken care of. And this is still a spot I think the Jets could upgrade on. I'm not going to recommend that for a couple of reasons we'll get into when we get to the interior guard positions. I think I feel good about George Fant moving forward for next season and hanging on to that tackle spot, even though, you know, there are people out there that, that you could get both in the draft and in free agency that could put out a better performance. What does bother me about the George Fant thing is right here, the $9 million. And that's not an outrageous number, but if I'm going to pay somebody $9 million, I expect them to play a good bit better than what we've got out of Fant in 2020. It wasn't a disaster. It wasn't horrible. It was solid, but it was nowhere near what I expect to get when I pay $9 million. And in all honesty, this was a bit of an overpay last offseason. I think everybody knew that, but Joe Douglas, again, I'm not criticizing him for that. Joe Douglas did what he had to do. He had to go out and get some guys on the offensive line so they could run the football, and so Sam Darnold or whoever the heck was playing quarterback for the Jets this year was not running for his life. And that was important, and that's exactly what the Jets did. 
Now looking ahead to 21, I'm still okay with George Fant there at tackle, but I would love to see this upgraded. I would love to see him get off of that CD category, that kind of threshold of do we even want him to start or not. Can he contribute? Yes. I want to get him off of that, and I'd love to see him step up and be the guy. Just be the guy there at tackle. And, and we haven't yet seen that. We haven't even seen flashes of that yet in Fant's four-year career. So I don't know that I'm expecting that. And I love having Fant on the team, and I'm okay with him being starting left tackle. It's just the $9 million that I'm paying here. And again, these numbers are rounded off right here. I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't really like having to pay $9 million for George Fant's performance in 2021 but if that's what we've got to do in order to compete next year and again cap space isn't a problem for the jets in 2021 so it's not a big deal you're okay there at tackle could you upgrade yes am i going to recommend that for this particular offseason the answer is no we're going to leave fant in my opinion right there and you'll be fine he's been consistent uh he's not going to win any awards i don't think i don't think he's going to be in competitions for any pro bowls or anything like that but I think you'll be okay for the next season, 2021, as long as he's staying healthy. And he's a likable guy. You really like George Fant, likable big big guy. Speaking of other big guys, you have Makai Becton here, and I'm giving him a B grade. What's not to like about Becton, okay? I mean, the guy is huge. The guy is fast. The guy can put people down on the ground sometimes. He showed flashes of being one of the best tackles in the game in his rookie season when he wasn't even healthy the whole year. So what's not to like about Becton? Uh, really, in truth, I, I, he really probably only earned a C grade this season, just that lockdown starter kind of a guy. But I think we've seen enough flashes here. And so based on potential, I've gone ahead and given him a B grade. And then by the time you factor in that rookie contract that he's on and will be on for the next two, uh, three seasons, he's making $4 million this year. So not only are you getting a great deal out of Becton, Looking ahead, you may have one of the best tackles in the game. Not that, we've still got to see that. He hasn't shown that yet. He's shown flashes of that. But for his rookie season, what more could you ask out of Becton? We want to see him healthy. We want to see him on the field every game. But Becton just looked very impressive this year. Wasn't always consistent. Of course, he wasn't always healthy. But looking forward, if he's healthy next year, I think you see a guy right here in Becton who in his second season – could be competing for a Pro Bowl spot, and then in seasons three and four, if he keeps, if he can be more consistent with some of the flashes that we've seen, you could have a guy who's competing for the best, one of the best tackle spots in the game. Not guaranteeing any of that, of course. We've seen guys show it in their rookie season and then never show it again. But you gotta like what you see out of Beckton, and of course, at four million dollars, I think it's a little under that. Actually, maybe three point seven. It's a great deal. Here Con uh, with Connor McGovern at center. McGovern for me, and, and, and again, it wasn't a disaster. He was solid, uh, but he didn't do what you would hope to get out of him when you're paying him $9 million. Now, last year, I think he made uh, a little over $7 million, seven and a half, seven point two, somewhere in there. This season, he would make a little bit over $9 million. When I bring a guy in, again, same thing as, as with Fant, and I think Fant has had a little bit better season than McGovern when you look at it. McGovern is a guy that I want to see more out of. I really need to, I need to see him be one of the top centers in football, quite honestly. He's getting paid both last year and this year. He's getting paid like one of the top 10, top 12 centers in the game. And there's not a lot of difference in price tag between, say, center number six and center number 12. So he's easily getting paid like one of the top 10 centers in the game, but that's not the performance we got out of McGovern this year. Now, again, it wasn't a disaster. It's better than what we got out of our centers in 2018 and 2019 for certain, so we had an upgrade. But I need to see more. I, I want to see a lot better performance for $9 million, and I've got McGovern here graded as that DC category, which basically means I'm not totally sure this is a guy I want to be starting and this is really where one of my draft recommendations is going to come in. I'll talk about it more in a minute. With McGovern for 2021, he's on the roster no matter what because the dead cap hit is over $10 million. There's just no way to let him go and save any money. But for 2021, he's there. 
And so you're not going to replace him in 2021. Your fingers are crossed here that you're paying him that kind of money, but he's going to show you that he's got that kind of value and got that kind of talent. In all honesty, we haven't seen that out of McGovern except for last year when he wasn't on the Jets. He was playing somewhere else. 2019, he had an excellent season, but in two seasons prior to that, his first and second year, we didn't see anything that promised that he could be any kind of a starter in the NFL. So basically here in four seasons for McGovern in the NFL, he's had one season in which he just played excellent football. He's had two seasons where he basically looked like somebody who should be coming off the bench. And then this year where he's looking like this is not really a guaranteed starter even. So very uneven results here for Connor McGovern. And again, that's not an effort thing. I'm not questioning the guy's heart or effort, but I am questioning the performance. And so hopefully if you're a Jets fan, you have every right to expect that McGovern steps up and plays better next year. And you know, listen, if everybody's healthy and if they've got another year together, this was their first year together, you've got every right to expect that if even no changes were made, the offensive line is going to improve at least a little bit. I wouldn't look for large improvements from this offensive line as it sits but they're all young enough and this was their first year together that you should see some improvements on the offensive line next year, even if they don't upgrade anything or change anybody. But that's what I'm feeling about Connor McGovern right there. Van Roden, I think you're getting an excellent deal right here. I think he checks in a little bit under $4 million, a little bit over, I don't remember exactly, but $4 million for 2021. He's been a solid performer just about his whole career, Van Roden has. Again, I don't think he's going to compete for any awards, so I don't give him a B grade, but this is a solid starter. I, I really like Van Roten here at guard. I really like his performance this year. He, he didn't blow us away, but he was solid. He was a solid starter, and he has been a solid uh, performer here for probably three seasons now in a row. This is not a guy who's had peaks and valleys in his career. This is a guy who has been consistent. So I really like Van Roten right here at guard, and I think you feel good uh, with Becton and Van Roten that you have two guys here who unquestionably are performing as starters, and then I think you have three guys here who are in that kind of gray area of can we upgrade and get better than this or not. And that brings us, of course, to Alex Lewis, who I've got as a CD grade. Alex Lewis has had, actually, excuse me, a good season, a very good season. Matter of fact, this season, Alex Lewis has played like a very good starter. The trouble is, this is the first time we've ever seen that from Alex Lewis. In previous seasons, he has looked decent at times. He has contributed at times for other teams, but this is the first time we've ever seen Alex Lewis really step up and hold down a starting job. Does that mean he's going to do that in future seasons? I don't know. And does that mean that in future seasons you're going to want to give him more money? I, I'm certainly not. He's already making $7 million, so I would say that he is earning his pay. But again, when you see a guy kind of peak in his fourth year, and this is something we see all over the NFL for all the kinds of different teams, year number four seems to be the peak year for a lot of guys because A, it's their contract season, and B, they've certainly got three years of experience by that time. So year number four tends to be a peak year for a lot of players in the NFL, and after that, you tend to see their performance go down whether they get the big money contract or not in season number five. So for Alex Lewis, do I feel good about him being starter next year? Yeah, I feel okay about it, especially if he does what he did this year. It, based on just this year alone, just this season, he, he played at a C level. But when I look at seasons 2019, 2018, 2017, I haven't seen anything like that out of Alex Lewis, and so that's why we've got the CD grade on him, just because of the inconsistency. Van Roten has been consistent now for three seasons. Lewis has not, even though Lewis played very good for me this year, and I really like what I got out of Alex Lewis this season. So we'll look at that moving forward, what you actually get. It's interesting here that the two guys I feel the best about, Beckton and Van Roten, are actually making the least money here on the offensive line, only about $4 million each in, in 2021. And the guys that I'm in the, on the fence about getting DC categories are the guys who we gave the most money to last offseason. So who knows why? Uh, the NFL and life itself is full of inconsistencies. So we'll keep an eye on those three guys. Let's move to the bench, and then we'll look at our recommendations for improving the offensive line. Edoga, I love Edoga. I love Edoga coming off the bench. I don't yet love him as a starter. I know he started eight games back in 2008, uh, 2019. He didn't look that great doing it. 
this year coming off the bench. I don't remember how many snaps he's played, somewhere around 200, 300 snaps coming off the bench and filling in in different places. Edoga has looked a lot better, but sometimes guys look a lot better when they're only getting two and 300 snaps. And then back when they're, when they're about to be in a starter, that performance tends to go down because NFL teams know how to prepare for them better and are spending more time looking at how to attack that guy who was starting than if he's just coming off the bench. So for Edoga here, I've got a D grade. He's only making about a million dollars, give or take a hundred thousand next season. You've got him. He could conceivably compete for a starting spot. He might be ready by another off season, get him into season number three. He might very well be ready to compete for a starting spot. So I love Edoga coming off the bench as a contributor, as a backup. And it may even be that Edoga in year number three is ready to compete for one of those starting uh, starting tackle spots. Elfline is a guy, again, making about a million dollars. He's a free agent this offseason. Um, you know what? I haven't seen enough out of Elfline to really say that he's even a contributor, that I, that I even want him. What, what we have seen of him has been wildly inconsistent. There were a couple of games where he held his own and he looked pretty good filling in. And then the more he played, it was like his performance kind of started to teeter off. And he didn't look so good anymore. And, and so that's not unusual. So I just haven't seen enough here out of Elfline to satisfy me as to whether or not I even want him as a contributor. Just for continuity's sake, I'm, I'm totally fine with bringing Elfline back if I can get him for that million-dollar category. If I've, started, if I've got to start giving him two or three million dollars to keep him on the team, I'm completely uninterested. So we'll see what to do with Elfline, but he is a free agent this offseason. And there were times this year where he looked like he was holding his own and times where he didn't. Cameron Clark, of course, we haven't gotten to look at him yet at all, unfortunately, due to the illness that he's been battling. Uh, but Cameron Clark drafted in the fourth round, coming out of Charlotte last year. You've certainly got to think, being drafted in the fourth round, that this guy can come in and contribute next season. I uh, wouldn't expect him to be getting any major playing time next season, but two or 300 snaps, starting to look at what he can do. Uh, that gives you some hope right there, some optimism for a draft pick that you haven't even gotten to see yet. And, of course, he's checking in at about a million dollars, I think a little bit uh, south of that, maybe around $750,000. Josh Andrews. This is a guy, again, I love coming off the bench. I, I have no, uh, no uh, thoughts at all of turning Josh Andrews into a starter, but as a, as a guy coming in off the bench, I love Josh Andrews. To me, he has high value, but making a million dollars, give or take, if, if, you, if you get him back next offseason. He is actually a restricted free agent, so you can get him back. And I don't remember what the RFA numbers are for the NFL this year, but for probably $750,000, $800,000, you could get him back. And that does add depth. And this is the difference between a guy that we've actually seen perform on the football field and a guy that we draft in the fifth or sixth round. You know, you'll, you'll hear a lot of folks talk about, well, um, we drafted this guy in the fifth round, and so that's adding depth, and you can look for that during next season. Guys drafted in the fifth and sixth round are not adding depth. We haven't seen them on a football field yet. Some of them can't even make the team the first year. Some of them don't make the team even in their third seasons. Uh, drafting guys in the fifth and sixth round is an investment for the future, not for next season. It does not add depth. Josh Andrews is different. This is a guy that we have seen on the football field, and he has held his own. He has not shown that he can be worthy of, of starting uh, anywhere in the NFL. We haven't seen that kind of performance, but this is a guy coming in off the bench. If I've got guys who are injured, and I'm going to have guys who are injured next season, he can come in and give me 200 snaps next season, and I don't feel bad about that. I know what I've got coming off the bench there. I know I've got somebody, and so for very cheap here, $100,000 probably, give or take 50000 I can get Josh Andrews back, and I'm excited about that. That is quality depth right there. That is a guy who has experience and who has been part of my system, and that is somebody who adds depth. So Andrews and Edoga excite me from that standpoint in that they do add quality depth here. We're not just talking about somebody that we think might could possibly sort of add depth. These guys add depth, all right? Edoga and Andrews. McDermott, I shortened his name to fit him on the board here. Haven't seen enough out of him really yet either. Usually when you haven't seen much out of guys for three or four seasons, there's a reason. Usually it's because they're just not good enough to be on the football field for major parts of the season. So for McDermott here, I would actually be interested in bringing McDermott back because it allows me not to have to spend 
my fifth and sixth round draft picks. And I know we've got nine draft picks this year if you're the Jets. But I would rather spend this season my fifth and sixth round draft picks on other positions like running back or CB or some other spot than offensive line. Because I've already got here with Edoga, with Clark, with Andrews. I've already got guys here who are pretty young, and, and I would hope to see them improve. Even if they don't improve to the point of being a starter, I, I would like to see them improve at least to the point of being quality backups. I've already got um, Andrews and Edoga here who are young and have shown performance wise that they can get things done. So I'm, I'm not in any mood here to let McDermott go. Even if I really don't plan on him playing this season, it keeps me from having to put out a fifth or sixth round draft pick. And he's an RFA for, actually he's a UFA, but for, if I can get him for about a million dollars or $800,000, I want him back just for continuity's sake. And it allows me to use these uh, draft picks on other position groups during this particular off season. Murray, the center, the backup center, again, haven't seen anything out of him. He's a restricted free agent. If we want, we could bring him back for somewhere in that $700,000, $850,000 category. I, again, I don't remember exactly the numbers. Personally, and this is, this is my real recommendation here for improving the offensive line, I don't want to throw any more money at it. Right now, if you put all these guys together for 2021, it's $40 million. That's not bad. It's not great. That's, that's kind of average for what you want to spend on an offensive line. Um, that's a little bit more than most teams are spending on their quarterback position. It's a lot more than some teams are spending on the quarterback position here on the offensive line. $40 million. That's pretty decent. Am I getting the performance I want for $40 million? I am not, but I don't want to put any more money at it. So I want to use a draft pick. What draft pick? Could I draft a, a starting tackle and let go of George Fant after 2021? I could do that, but I'm really not in the mood to do that because I don't think that's my weakest spot. I think my weakest spot right now is the interior guard positions, and specifically with McGovern especially and with Lewis. And again, I know we're spending money on those guys, but if you just look at their performance, it gives me reason to worry, especially when I look at what they've done over the past three seasons and not just what they did this year. So for McGovern and Lewis, I'm looking to try to upgrade. Maybe I can't upgrade in 21, but if I use a draft pick now and that guy's ready by 2022, then that's the smart thing I think to do. So what I'm going to do here, my only real recommendation for upgrading this offensive line, I'm going to let Jim, uh, Jimmy Murray go. I'm not going to bring him back at any price. I'm just going to let him go. And probably... Probably, I think the smart thing to do, and again, bringing in a fifth or sixth round draft pick is statistically very unlikely that they're going to develop into a starter. It does happen, but that's unlikely. What I'm really looking for here is one of those late first, early second round draft picks. You've got two draft picks right there at the end of the first, at the earliest part of the second round. I um, don't know exactly where they're going to land yet, but they're right there in that category. Those two draft picks, I personally would like to use one of those draft picks on the interior of the offensive line. And that could be Trey Hill, a guy like Trey Hill out of Georgia, who's been a, an excellent center for the Bulldogs for a couple of seasons now. It could also be a guy like uh, Rashawn Slater out of Northwestern, who's played all different kinds of positions, guard, center, tackle. Um, and didn't play this, off, this season for Northwestern. He opted out. But that's the kind of, kind of guy that you would be looking at here on the interior, and, and then you could even go strictly with the guard positions. Those are the kinds of things I would be looking for. And, and that would, what that would let me do is it gives me somebody to compete with McGovern right away. If I draft a guy late first, early second, typically speaking, that's a guy who can step in and compete for a starting job with another guy who is struggling to hang on to that job. And that perfectly defines McGovern to me. Some of you guys may look at McGovern very differently, but that's what I've seen out of McGovern this year. That at least gives us a guy to compete with McGovern. I expect McGovern to win that battle if that's a position battle at all next year. But even if not, it gives me a guy who in 2021, I would hope could maybe step forward and be the starter. And I could let McGovern go at that point for a very little dead cap hit in 2022 moving ahead and that allows me to let Murray go and just simply replace him with the draft pick. So I do not expect much changes at all for these guys. It's pretty much what it's going to be for 2021. You might see one or two changes. Those are the changes I recommend right there 
on the interior of the offensive line. So I think the five starters are going to stay the same. I think the backups are largely going to stay the same. If I had my way about it, certainly they would. Uh, I would just make a couple of those small changes. The, the only real thing I'm recommending here, late first, early second round draft pick, you use that to try to upgrade the interior of the offensive line. They compete for a starting job, even if they don't win it in 2022, you would, you would think that they would have a very good chance of stepping in and being a starter and moving that offensive line group from being just a competitive offensive line to an actual middle of the pack offensive line and maybe even a good offensive line. All right, this has been longer than I expected to talk about it. Thank you so much for watching us today. We'll see you next time. Um, I know some of you want to see cap numbers and things like that. Some of the overall cap numbers, we'll cover that more as the offseason goes along. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.